Hi, welcome back to Mechanical PE Exam Prep. This is Dan. Today we're going to be working on a problem on HVAC, and this one is um, also involves psychrometrics, which really ties in closely with HVAC. So let's get started. 340 pounds per hour of dry 800 degree Fahrenheit air are diverted through a high temperature scrubber in order to reduce particulate emissions. Since the scrubber is constructed with elastromeric seals, the air temperature must first be reduced to 360 degrees. This temperature reduction occurs when the air is passed through a 78 degree water spray. The pressure in the spray chamber is 85 PSI. And they want to know two things. A, how much water in pounds per hour is required, so what's the mass flow rate of the water, and B, what is the relative humidity of the air as it leaves the spray chamber. So I've drawn a little picture on the right of what's going on. We have dry air entering at a known mass flow rate and a known temperature, and then it's being sprayed with water. We don't know the mass flow rate of water, that's the first thing we wanna find out, and we do know the temperature of the water, and we know the pressure of the spray chamber. And then coming out, we have this air which is now cooled off by having evaporated the water in that spray. Now it's 360 degrees Fahrenheit, and they want us to find the relative humidity. So I think one important concept to just highlight before we walk through the steps here is how this is working. That water is evaporating, so essentially it's going from being liquid water to being a superheated water vapor, which is contained in the air. We don't often think about it, but when you have air with some humidity, the water vapor that's in the air is really a superheated vapor, and it takes an enormous amount of energy to boil water or to change from liquid water to a super, superheated vapor. So the water is heating up, it's acquiring energy from the air, and the air reduces its temperature significantly as it effectively, we don't think of it as boiling the water, but that's exactly what's happening. It's, it's taking on water and becoming humid air and uh, changing the state of that water vapor. And, so the, temp the final temperature is going to be somewhere between these two, between 800 degrees Fahrenheit and 78, and we know what it ends up being. It ends up being 360. This problem really helps you appreciate how powerful evaporation is as a means of heat transfer. So if you have an experience working with cooling towers, you really realize how much, uh, how much heat can be transferred out of, let's say, condenser water on the roof of a building into the atmosphere, even on a hot and relatively humid day. So let's outline the steps that we're going to use for this problem. The first thing we'll do is we'll write the heat flow balance. Specifically, we know that the heat that goes out of the air goes into the water. So we can say Q dot air out equals Q dot water in. The next thing we'll do is we'll solve for Q dot air out because we know the mass flow rate and the temperature change, so we can do that. Now the right side of the equation in order to find the mass flow rate, we need to figure out the enthalpies for water, both the liquid water and the water vapor, which I think is the most interesting part of this problem. So we're gonna look up those enthalpy values. Then after that, that gives us the answer to part A. We'll use the mass flow rates to find the mole flow rates, and you'll see where we're going with that. And lastly, we'll calculate the mole fraction of water, the partial pressure of the water, and ultimately the relative humidity, which is the answer to part B. Okay, so let's get started on part one. So we know that the heat coming out of the air is going into the water. So we can write Q dot air out equals Q dot water in. And the next question is how do we want to represent this? So we have a couple of options. We could write MC delta T or we could write M dot delta H, which are both acceptable. I'm going to use MC delta T on the left and M delta H on the right. I'll explain why. So for air, let's write M dot air I'll just put A for air, CP delta T, and then on the right, I'll do M dot W for water, delta H for water. Okay, so ideally, I'd like to just look up the enthalpies and do M delta H for the airs as well. But what's interesting is the temperatures of air that we have are 360 and 800. So it's actually hard to directly look up the enthalpies for these. The psychrometric chart doesn't go up that high. There's probably other ways to do it, but the most intuitive way I thought was just use MCP delta T. Uh, the only slight issue there is regarding the specific heat capacity of air, which is normally taken as 0.24. I wanted to check that and make sure it was valid. So I looked up in app 
35C, which is the properties of atmospheric air. And what you see there is that specific heat capacity is basically a function of temperature. It is affected by pressure, but not as much as you would think. There's actually a note on the bottom of that table, and it reads CP, C sub P, and a few other parameters that are also in that same table, does not depend greatly on pressure and can be used over a wide range of pressures. So we don't have to worry about pressure difference. We can basically treat the specific heat capacity as being purely a function of temperature. That's a good enough approximation. And then I looked at what it was over the range of temperatures that we care about. As you go up to higher temperatures, it does increase slightly. And I looked at the range between about 400 and 800, and it seemed to center around 0.25. So not a huge difference, but a little bit higher. So I am gonna use 0.25 for this solution. And again, there may be different ways to come at this. If you can figure out how to look up the enthalpies directly, please let me know, but this is what I found out. And if you, if you just took the more commonly accepted CP equals 0.24, you would be um, introducing, let's say, 4% error, so you might still get away with it. So maybe not a huge deal, you decide. Also, as a reminder, you have H equals CP delta T, which is just kind of showing that there's two different ways to come about this. You could do M dot delta H, or you could do MCP delta T, and they're basically the same thing. If you're curious, that's equation 3818B. Okay, so actually we have everything we need to solve the left side of that equation, so let's go ahead and do it. So the mass flow rate is 340 pounds per hour, and CP we're taking as 0.25 BTU per pound, and the delta T is 800 degrees Fahrenheit minus 360 degrees Fahrenheit, which ultimately gives us a heat transfer of 37,400 BTU per hour. So that's how much heat is coming out of the air, and thus going into the water. So now we can turn our attention to the right side of the equation. So let's unpack that a little bit. We have m dot delta h for the water, which is equal to m dot water times h2 minus h1, where h2 is the final temperature of the water and h1 is the initial temperature of the water. And now we can find m dot w by looking up h2 and h1. So let's take H1 first. H1 is the liquid water that's being sprayed into the air. And we know the pressure is 85 PSIA in the chamber. And we know the temperature of that water is 78 degrees Fahrenheit. Now we have every reason to believe that this is liquid water, but I'm just gonna confirm it. So if you check app 23B, which is the steam table, you can look up the saturation temperature at 78 degrees Fahrenheit. and it equals 316 degrees. Obviously, we're far below that at 78, so we know that this is definitely a subcooled liquid. So how do we actually look up the enthalpy? We now want to turn to the other steam table, which is app 23A, and we're gonna look at the column that shows H sub F because it's liquid water. So H sub F at T equals 78 degrees, since this table is organized by temperature equals 46.07 BTU per pound. So that gives us H1. Okay, now we're ready to take a look at H2. Now H2 is a little trickier. H2, we think it's going to be water vapor. And we think that because the hot air is turning the liquid water into superheated water vapor, which is within the air as a way of cooling it off. Now, that's not necessarily the case. It could be getting part of the way there, but still be a saturated mixture. We should confirm to make sure it truly is superheated, and then that'll give us some guidance as to how we look up the enthalpy. So we think it's water vapor. Its temperature is 360 degrees Fahrenheit, and the pressure, so this is where it gets interesting. The pressure, it's tempting to say that it's 85 PSI, but it's not. The pressure of this water vapor is the partial pressure that the water vapor has within the air. So the pressure of the air, the total pressure is 85 PSI, but most of that comes from the contribution of the partial pressure of dry air. And the partial pressure of water vapor is just a part of that. In fact, it's probably a relatively small part. And if we use the pressure of 85, we'll be, we'll be way off. So now I'm going to take a look at the superheated steam table, because we don't actually know what the partial pressure 
of water is here. So if the enthalpy depends on two things, if it depends on the temperature and the pressure, and we don't know the pressure, then we're kind of going to be stuck. So, but something interesting happens in uh, in the superheated steam table. So, open up app 23C, superheated steam table, and I'm actually going to write down an example of a few of the things I noticed there. And for this example, I'm just going to look at the 400 degree range. So, let temperature equal 400 degrees F. So, if you jot down some of the pressures on the left side, it offers one psi. I'm not even going to write the units, but that's psi. Uh, 5 psi, 10 psi, 14.7. And now let's look at the corresponding enthalpies for these pressures at that temperature. This one equals 1241.8. The next one is 1241.3. This one is 1240.6. This one is 1240 even. And this one's 1239.3. So lo and behold, all these enthalpies are similar, even though these are very different pressures. And another thing to realize is that regardless of which enthalpy we're using, these enthalpies are way high. We're going to be subtracting the enthalpy of the water from this when we do the delta H, which is only 46. So do you think it matters a lot which one of these is actually the right one? It's really not that important. It's going to be a huge delta. And these are only different by, you know, one as a percentage of a thousand. That's like a tenth of a percent. So we're not even going to worry about knowing exactly what the vapor pressure is. We can just guess. We can just literally pick any one of these and we'll be fine. So why don't we try 10? So from all this, we'll say, let's try P vapor. The partial pressure of the water vapor in the air is 10 PSI. Now this was just my example. The temperature is not actually 400, it's 360. So we do have to interpolate. I just wanted to, to prove that point so that we didn't have to interpolate five times for me to make this point. Um, so if you look at only at the line where the partial pressure water vapor is 10 PSI, now we're gonna look at the temperature above and below, which is uh, 300 and 400. So we'll say the enthalpy for T equals 300 degrees F would be 1194, and the enthalpy for T equals 400 degrees F would be 1241, and we're dealing with 360, so we can take three-fifths of the difference and add it to 1194. So we get H for T equals 360 is about 1222 BTU per pound. Okay, so now we can come back up to our main equation here, M delta H which we were going to set equal to 37,400. So let's pick it up with delta H. We now know delta H for water equals that 1222 that we just found, minus the 46 from the liquid water, which is about 1176 BTU per pound. And now we can solve for the mass flow rate of water, which is the total energy from the left side of the equation, which we had as 37,400 BTU per hour divided by our delta H, 1176 BTU per pound mass, which gives us a mass flow rate for the water of 31.8 pounds per hour. And that is answer A. Okay, so other than that assumption about the partial pressure of water, that was fairly straightforward. Now we wanna move on to the second part of figuring out what the relative humidity is. Let me just jump back up to the top for a second. We have this mass flow rate of air, which we were given, and now we know the mass flow rate of water. So we're interested in finding out the relative humidity on the way out. What we're gonna do is we're gonna use the molecular weights of air and water to find out the mole flow rates. And then from the mole flow rates, we can find out the mole fraction of water, which is gonna help us find out the actual partial pressure of water. We can confirm our assumption from earlier. And then that's gonna help us find the relative humidity. So let's do that first part of going from mass flow rates to mole flow rates. So starting with the water, we have 31.8 and the molecular weight of water is 18, right? 16 for oxygen and two for uh, one for each hydrogen is two of them. So 18 pounds per mole. And that gives us 1.77 moles per hour. That's for the water. Now for the air. Now the molecular weight of air, you may remember that it's 29 pounds per mole. And if you remember that, great. If you have to look it up, that's fine too. Another way to remember it is air is mostly nitrogen and nitrogen is 14 and it's N, it's N2, so there's 28. And oxygen, which is 
16 times 2, so it's 32. And there's more nitrogen than oxygen, so 28 has a bigger pull on the overall molecular weight than 32. So you can remember it's closer to nitrogen than it is to oxygen, and that's why it's 29. Or another way you could remember it is if you remember the ratios of how much nitrogen and oxygen are in dry air, you can work it out exactly. And this is just a little reminder, you don't have to go through all this, but I'm gonna show it um, because I think it's really helpful to recall this. So if you have 28 pounds per mole for nitrogen, and you know that there are 3.77 parts nitrogen for every one part oxygen, and I suggest you remember this for combustion problems, and there's 32 pounds per mole for oxygen and just one part of that, and in total that's 4.77 parts. So if you work that out, you get 28.84 pounds per mole, which is very close to the 29 estimate that we would have used. And so the mole flow rate is gonna be the mass flow rate, 30, sorry, 340 pounds per hour, divided by that molecular weight, 28.84 pounds per mole. That makes 11.79 moles per hour. And now if we have 11.79 moles per hour of air, dry air, and 1.77 moles per hour, we can find the mole fraction. We know the mole fraction for an ideal gas corresponds to the proportion of volumes of each and conveniently the partial pressure, which is where we're going with this. So let's work out that mole fraction. Mole fraction of water is the 1.77 moles per hour over 1.77 plus 11.79. So that's 0.131, or you can think of it as 13.1% of the volume is water vapor. And the big important point here is that this is also the partial pressure ratio. So by virtue of the fact that 13% of the volume is water, 13% of the absolute pressure, the total pressure is 85, 13% of that is coming from the water vapor. So let's find out the partial pressure of the water vapor. 0.131 times 85 PSI is 11.1 PSIA. And I think it's worth pointing out that this was very close to our assumption, which was 10 PSI. But there's nothing special about that. If we had chosen a different partial pressure, it didn't have a big effect on the enthalpy that we would have chosen. So we still would have gotten a number very close to this. Okay, and then lastly, we're going to invoke equation 38.9, which says that the relative humidity is equal to the partial pressure of water vapor, I'll write it as P vapor, sometimes I write it as P water, over the saturation pressure at a particular temperature. So P sat at T equals, why don't we call it T dB. So in other words, for air at a particular temperature, there is some saturation pressure. The water vapor is a percentage of that. If it's 100% of that saturation pressure, it's 100% relative humidity. If it's 0%, it's completely dry. So, so we can look up the saturation pressure in the steam table. So we'll open up app 23A, and we want to find P sat at 360 degrees F and we find out that it is 153 PSIA. So if the partial pressure of water vapor got to be higher and higher and eventually got to be this high, then that would be 100% relative humidity. In our case, the partial pressure of water vapor is only 11.1 .1 PSIA. So what is that as a percentage of 153.03 PSIA? saturation pressure at that temperature. That is only 0 0.0725, call it 7.3% relative humidity. And that is answer B. So key takeaways from this problem, finding the partial pressure of water vapor is a really important part of this problem. It's what allows you to find the relative humidity. In the MERM, there's actually six ways to find the partial pressure of water. So that's how important it is. I think the easiest way is usually to use the psych chart. We didn't use it in this problem because the temperatures were so high, the, the chart doesn't go that high. So we had to use other methods and, and that's why we went the way we did. There's also some dynamic lookup calculators, psychrometric calculators you can find online. I'll post a link to one 
in the, the references for the HVAC section on the website, but I don't think you should rely on that because you won't have it on test day. So you really wanna know how to use the psychrometric chart, the MERM, any resources that you're actually gonna bring with you. But it is a good way as you're studying to check because you might come at it a number of different ways and you're trying to sense check yourself. It's good to be able to just pop in any two facts as long as you know any two things about the state of air if you know the temperature and the pressure, you can find out the enthalpy, the specific volume, the absolute humidity, basically anything else you want to know. So hopefully that helped. If you have any questions or comments, please drop me an email or leave a comment right below this video. Otherwise, I will see you in the next video.